Hello and welcome. It's great to see so many of you here. My name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center uh, here at SOAS. And I'm very proud to present a double act, let's say, or you know, maybe a, a triple threat, which in musical theater, of course, is somebody who can um, sing, dance, and act. And really, um, the lineup today, we have all we have the sort of the ac academic equivalents um, of these skills. We have the um, the ethnographic experience. We have the uh, theoretical mouse. And we have uh, the institutional uh, kudos um, to um, really make this a very exciting uh, presentation. So I have here with me um, Professor Hirofumi Katsuno, uh, who is an associate professor at Doshisha uh, University. Uh, we go back quite a long time. We were at, at Doshisha together um, in the 2010s, uh, the very beginning. Um, he's a professor uh, in media studies in the Faculty of Social Studies, um, and his primary research interest uh, is uh, the sociocultural impact of new media technologies. And uh, I, I must also say that he is really one of the first persons who has written, who has done research about robot, who has written about the heart of the robot, still one of the sort of the, the, the field defining articles that, um, that sort of shaped the ways we think about uh, Japanese engagement with robotics. On the other hand of the screen is Dr. Daniel White, uh, who is a, a senior research associate at the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Cambridge. Um, he is the affect uh, specialist. He has published widely and also critically about affect theory and its relation to technology. Both our presenters today have published an article uh, together recently that appeared in 2021 in Cultural Anthropology uh, and was entitled Towards an Effective Sense of Life, Artificial Intelligent, Intelligence, Animacy and Amusement at a Robot Pet Memorial Service in Contemporary uh, Japan. So I'm very happy to have them both here. And I'll hand over to them now. Just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A. You can also later, um, when we have a discussion at the end, you can raise your hand um, or you can put uh, questions in the chat. So without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fabio. <laughs> Uh, thanks especially for raising expectations far beyond what is going to be <laughs> ever possible to deliver after that, <laughs> um, especially with the dancing and singing references, of which there will be absolutely none from my side, uh, at least for the next hour and a half, that is. Um, I'll just try to share my screen and make sure that we are all viewing the same thing. So presumably you are seeing a I have a pet robot on your end, and if so, then I'll, uh, I'll get us started here. So um, the material that we're going to present, some of it uh, does indeed come from that article that Fabio kindly mentioned, um, and we will be focusing a bit on amusement today and what it can uh, contribute to our thoughts about specifically uh, care robots, which often get more attention in um, the literature on um, robot culture in Japan. And the work that we will present is part of a broader project that uh, Hiro and I have been working on for the last four years or so, and that we titled Model Emotion. And uh, here's the web link for that if you care to um, look at any of the recent publications that we try to keep up to date on that site. So this project uh, has several parts um, and includes a year of field work among robot producers in Japan. Uh, as well as the UK as well, where we both are at the moment. Um, and where we are looking at how engineers build models of emotion to replicate in machine systems, essentially, uh, whether software programs or hardware. So why we choose this phrase model emotion? In short, we are quite interested in how programmers and roboticists in Japan are essentially modeling emotion in machines. And we think of modeling in different ways, namely in theoretical, technological, and then in social and ethical dimensions. Um, so this word model is a very sort of 
nice term for us to cover all three of these quite usefully. This is an interesting framework for us because the way programmers model emotion in Japan reveals, we think, some very interesting aspects of how cultural differences are imagined and circulate through worlds of both robot storytelling and robot scientific practice. So for example, sometimes emotion modelers in Japan, um, people taking models of emotion from psychology and trying to put them into machine platforms for uh, example, in robots that can presumably read or sense emotion or even perform emotion. Sometimes in that process, roboticists in Japan will simply borrow a human emotional theory from Western psychology and apply it directly to building emotional AI in a robot. And the example that I've, I've often used before that you may have seen yourself is, is um, for example, the robot Paruro by Fujisoft, um, who has a very clear capacity to read facial expressions, which is based off of the famous American psychologist Paul Ekman's psychological theory of emotions, which gets called today the basic theory of emotions or basic emotions theory, where um, Ekman presumed that emotions are essentially universal across cultures, they're rooted in our evolutionary history, and we can observe them more or less in kind of these six, though sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less basic emotions which are observable in facial expressions. Um, of course, in conjunction with this, Ekman developed the famous facial action coding system in order to understand his own, or let's say codify his own videos that he was taking of facial expressions um, back in the 60s and the 70s. And of course, building a system like this is very attractive for engineers who already have at their hands now an easy system for implementing a psychological theory into a machine theory of emotion. So, it's easy to see why Ekman's theory would be popular for roboticists around the world, Japan included. So this is one way that emotion models, so to speak, get built into robots. Um, on the other hand, sometimes such theories of modeling emotion or modeling human emotion, let's say, are seen by Japan roboticists as quite limited. Um, and in these cases, designers rather choose to emphasize how emotion or what we might what we might better call affect as it's pointing to sort of feelings in the body that haven't perhaps quite taken a linguistic term or, or a conscious recognition, how that's constructed interactively between human, robot, and the environment in unpredictable ways. So in these cases, cases such as in the robot uh, Love It or Raboto, designers take a rather exploratory approach Rather than modeling human emotions or desires in a robot based off a specific psychological model of emotion from humans, um, they are rather experimenting and testing which robot capacities cultivate feelings of affection. And of course, this is in a very moving and fluid environment of human robot interaction in Japan. So in this sense, we might talk less about human emotion or robot emotion and more about the mutual production of human robot intimacy which is really an unknown and evolving emotional experience. So today we want to focus on the sphere of kind of as yet undetermined emotional experience and intimacy that takes place not in a human or in a human's imagination of a robot, but in this kind of fully interactive setting with a lot of exchange going back and forth between an environment, between people, between objects and so on. So let me give some context for what we'll present today in a little bit more detail and try to outline a basic argument that will perhaps help everyone follow along and formulate some questions. So today there's a large focus in Japan robotics and robotics research on care, I think it's fair to say. This is obviously very sensible and understandable for all the kind of canonical reasons which are often cited in Japan studies research about demographic challenges and changes in Japan, the increasing number of elderly, the increasing number of children, how those aspects challenge the national pension system, the difficulty of securing care labors. These are all kind of canonical um, social problems or shakai mondai that, that really get um, crystallized or typified in Japan studies research. So these problems are, are well-defined by researchers and justify some of the really quite quite amazing research that is being done on robots and robotics and care sectors in Japan, such as uh, Jennifer Robertson by James Wright, by Naonori Kodate and David Prendergast, who presented their wonderful film on care robots here in this venue a few weeks ago, and by people like Anne Aronson, who I believe, if I'm not mistaken, will present here as well in 
um, in a few weeks. So we, um, we love this research and are highly indebted to it. And additionally, we also think that to the degree that care robots take center stage in Japan, in Japan robotics research, it can also sometimes obscure an important point about human robot relations in Japan and how those feed into society. Uh, and a point emphasized by many roboticists in Japan themselves, which is that they are in it for the fun of it. Thus, taking a kind of anthropological perspective on this point, we want to ask what role fun is playing in mediating what social institutions and funders in Japan think robots are good for and should be made for on one hand, and then what roboticists are really practically aiming to do in their scientific practice on the other hand. So to illustrate this, we'll, we will draw on uh, two aspects of our research that we've done over the last few years among, among others. Uh, first, Aibo Robot Memorial Service is a, a kind of return to this quite popular topic in Japan. And then second, a recent history of digital pets that we call haptic creatures, and that's what I'm gonna hand it over to, to Hiro. So our streamlined and, and somewhat vulgarly formulated argument for today is that fun is an important category to think through because it allows us to see how both serious practical concerns um, about robotics most identified with the care sector and then personally or existentially playful robot practices which are often more identified with the entertainment robotic sector actually mutually define work together to define how robots should participate in um, to borrow Kodate and Prendergast's wonderful phrase, circuits of care. So let me jump straight into some examples of, of fun and amusement in human robot relations in order to examine what particular capacities fun affords care, so to speak. So you will no doubt be familiar with memorial services for broken down Sony pet robots called Ibo. Um, and if not, I'll give you just a very brief introduction. And in all of these descriptions, I'm going to try to highlight how fun and robotics are intertwined in robot culture, which for us helps explain why so many roboticists in Japan say they got into ro robotics for the fun of it in the first place. So how did these Aibo Kuyo services or memorial or funerary services get started? Um, importantly, these services have, have several historical precedents in ceremonies for inanimate objects in Japan. Um, such as sewing needles, dolls, or, or even more recently, digital devices like smartphones and computers. Um, however, because our very esteemed host, Professor Fabio Gigi, has written so expertly and extensively on this aspect of Japanese culture, we would be far too embarrassed to speak to that here ourselves. So if you have any super challenging questions on the history of these ceremonies, I urge you to direct them rigorously to Professor Gigi. Uh, in our case, we're gonna skip ahead a little bit to the particular context for why the Buddhist priest Oi Bungen, who you see pictured here, developed these particular memorial services for Ibo robots in conjunction with acquaintances formerly at Sony. So to summarize, the mechanical pets for which the priest Oi-san conducts Kuyo services, memorial services, are named Ibo, uh, which stands for Artific Artificially Intelligent Robot. Importantly, this acronym is, is also applied to the Japanese word Aibo, which means friend or companion. And Aibo was created in Sony's computer science laboratory in the mid 1990s and uh, released in 1999. Uh, when it was, Aibo exceeded all expectations. The first 5,000 models made available in Japan actually sold out in 20 minutes. And they attracted not only the, the presumed target audience of 30 something male technophiles, but also quite to the surprise of engineers, uh, women in their 50s and above. And this is highlighted in, in research um, by Kubuaki Nodi and, and a bit by Fabio Gigi as well. Um, so these owners, or ona as they called themselves, dressed their Aibo in clothing and gathered together with friends to share stories and watch Aibo play. And quite interestingly, they were enchanted when Aibo learned a new trick or, or did something unexpected. So many in these cases felt that their Aibo had its own personality, its own spirit, or even a kind of heart or kokoro. And when Aibo began to grow old then, so to speak, they naturally, the owners naturally sought you know, to seek care for these robots that had become an important member of their family. However, when due to the shifting priorities and economic challenges in the company of Sony, 
and they consequently discontinued its Ivo line in 2006. The company also stopped servicing those models in need of repair, leaving many of these customers distraught, essentially. So recognizing the deep attachment that owners had cultivated for their Ivo, a former Sony employee named Norimatsu Nobuyuki set up his own operation, which he playfully named A Fun Company or A Fun Kabushiki Aisha, to meet customers' needs in a way that respected how owners felt for their robot kin. So at a service center that he developed, employees use words like surgery instead of repair. They refer to the other eyeball models from which parts are borrowed as organ donors. And for those owners whose eyeball are beyond repair but could potentially become a donor, Norimatsu-san sought help from what he called, quote, an interesting Buddhist monk that he heard talking one day on a local radio program. Um, and so he got in touch with this interesting monk, who is Oisan, and they decided to offer this memorial service to assist those who found it difficult to part with their robot family members. So a bit of a technophile in his own right, um, the Buddhist priest Oisan was quite happy to oblige in this request. And when each ceremony that Oisan officiates comes to an end, and the Ibo souls of the robots are released from their robot bodies with, uh, within the realm of the, the ceremony, the employees of a Fun Company, um, who actually outnumber the, the owners in attendance to these ceremonies, um, they then pack up these robots in boxes and send them to the company's service center to find new life in other ailing Ibo bodies. So according to Eifan's uh, Norimatsu-san, the ceremonies have contributed not only to the care of his customers and the success of his company, but also to Sony's decision to re-release Aibo in 2018. And here's the new Aibo branded in, in lowercase, which is so the company says equipped with the latest artificial intelligence. So we find this latter point on AI quite critical as it suggests that the role fun has not only in defining care, but also in directing trends in serious research in artificial emotional intelligence. So let me try to give a few more examples of this. One main challenge of Sony engineers in their aim to cultivate human robot intimacy and connection um, in building Ivo was to try to give Ivo a quote unquote sense of reality, or a sense of lifelikeness, which engineers call in Japanese seimeikan. Um, what, according to engineers, was integral to cultivating this idea of seimeikan, this idea of lifelikeness in Aibo, was not only this kind of similarity to living things in terms of movement and natural environments, but also this capacity to evoke surprise, charm, and a sense of playfulness in human robot, robot interaction. So Aibo's engineers at Sony committed themselves in the early 1990s to building a robot that not only seemed alive, but was also amusing and fun. To realize this aim, they famously rewrote two of Asimov's, Isaac Asimov's, three laws of robotics. So that while Ivo maintained the first precept that a robot should not harm a human, it would also follow a second to attend to and love its owners. And then a third rule that dictated that even if obliged to listen unremittingly to an owner's sloppy talk, Sometimes it just say nasty things in return. And we draw this from Kubo Akinori's um, powerful article in 2010 on Ibo. So this element of the unknown equipped Ibo with a spontaneity and um, a recalcitrance, um, to borrow a very useful word from, um, from Fabio Gigi's own discussion of Ibo. Um, so engineers added then to this an effective engine, which was in fact based on Paul Ekman's theory of basic emotions mentioned earlier. Um, and then on top of this, they layered an ability for Ibo to um, in software learn as it developed through four developmental stages, uh, infancy, adolescence, youth, and adulthood. So according to this model, each robot would develop a kind of unique personality based on interactions with its environment and owners. This developmental approach to engineering emotion then afforded Ibo the capacity to solicit care from consumers through interactions in social and more specifically in domestic settings. So in this way, and confirmed in other accounts of users interacting with, with Ibo, um, consumers engaged in robot sense making, making sense of what a robot is, to what degree it's alive, by fixing the meaning, the pleasure, and the emotional needs such companion robots would ultimately serve. So most interestingly for us, 
when Sony engineers programmed only these four software stages of development into Ivo, upon the breakdown of Ivo's mechanical body, users introduced death as what they felt was a necessary fifth stage. So in enacting the importance of death to artificial life and in then reciprocating care for an agent designed to care for them, both consumers and producers draw on these affects of amusement and pleasure to help them make sense of the feelings that oblige them to care for Ibo even in death. Now, this point of amusement and fun and its role in generating a sense of life likeness in Ibo is instructive for us because it shows how defining what it means to be alive is wrapped up not in scientific discourses or not only in scientific discourses of, of what is animate and what is inanimate or what is organic and inorganic life, but rather it takes place in these reciprocal practices of care, humans caring for robots, robots caring for humans. Now, this might be an obvious enough point, but it also goes a bit further. For the organizer of Aibo Kuyo, Oisan, again pictured here, the fun that one can generate with Aibo not only teaches us about care, but also about the fundamental nature of reality, um, at least from Oisan's Buddhist perspective of the world. Um, his Nichiren Buddhist perspective of the world, I might say more specifically. So in explaining the importance of fun in Aibo, Oisan regularly cited to us in, in um, the conversations we, we had over him, we, we had with him. Um, he often cited playfulness as one reason he and Norimatsu-san from A Fun Corporation started Aibo Kuyo. An explanation he drew on the work of the Dutch cultural historian Johan Huizinger. Um, and Oysen said Huizinger argued that play constituted a fundamental component for the generation and transmission of culture. Oysen explained, quote, it's like Mother Goose, or think of the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, that he's sort of singing out as he explains this to us. Um, Oisan goes on, play is central to humans. So Oisan's reference to play and Huizinga served not only as a useful way to explain Aibo Kuyo to these kind of curious foreign academics who had sought him out, but it also captured Oi's way of using fun as a method of feeling into the reality of what Aibo is, a kind of somatic method, a bodily method to make sense out of his world. Um, and I think the sentiment of amusing sense-making captures not only how many robot fans engage with entertainment robots in Japan, um, but also roboticists themselves as they apply the amusing challenges of building robots to practical and social problems concerning how to use technology to facilitate care. As Oisan says, I had put a lot of energy into trying to understand what they had taught me in my Buddhist studies. They taught me that everything has consciousness. There's a teaching called San Senso Mokishitsu Busho. Uh, the mountains and rivers and grasses and trees all have the Buddha nature. But I'm not particularly smart, so I didn't understand what this meant. But with Aibo, I discovered what this meant not through thinking, but through feeling. So this appeal to feeling and to amusement is critical for Oisan. Um, whenever we challenged Oisan with analytical questions about whether Aibo was really alive or not, really had a soul or not. Um, he always turned this into a chance for a joke and for amusement, never committing to one thing or the other. And the ceremony that he officiates himself is designed as a way not to understand um, the ontological reality of Aibo, but rather to feel into it um, and to feel into a relationship with Aibo that is caring, but also pleasurable. So it's about creating an effect much like uh, rituals are in, in general, one might argue. Thus, these notions of investigating the world and the role of artificial agents in it are deeply connected with aspects of reciprocal care, as well as with an entertainment robotics industry, which is committed to creating, to testing, and refining in ever more sophisticated ways artificial agents who are capable of generating opportunities for pleasure wrapped up in reciprocal care. That becomes a big part of building an, uh, an entertainment robotics or companion robotics market. And it's this value, I would argue, that drives a lot of robot design in the entertainment robotics world and that feeds into AI research, as well as into the care robotic, uh, robotic sector. So perhaps this is, and I, I think this is even more so than 
slightly abstract notions and arguments that we often hear that um, hear from robot makers or policy makers who sometimes um, argue that we have this kind of social obligation to care for the elderly. And the only practical way to do this because of labor shortages is to turn to robots to do so. So to be clear, robot designers are, are quite explicit about this connection between entertainment robotics and AI research. In a 2001 paper published in Japan's major scientific journal of artificial intelligence, Fujita Masahiro, the leading artificial intelligence expert collaborating on Ivo's design, cited the important role that robot entertainment could play in leveraging industry towards scientific research. So Fujita and colleagues have also called for the creation of a new industry focused specifically on robot entertainment. They write that we, sorry, I skipped ahead. We strongly believe that after the gold rush of the internet and cyberspace, people will eagerly seek real objects to play with and touch. Robot entertainment provides tangible physical agents and an unquestionable sense of reality. So for Fujita and other engineers at Sony, constructing this tangible sense of reality, say Macon again, in Ibo, or what we alternatively uh, sometimes call a sense of life, uh, was important not only for providing entertainment through a commodity, but also for realizing technological breakthroughs or gijitsu no breakthroughs in AI. So this focus on designing robots with first and foremost an emphasis on its evocative, lifelike, interactive capacities to appeal to others, and to bring uh, pleasure is seen quite clearly in a variety of new mass marketed companion robots designed to care and relate to humans, such as the humanoid robot Pepper, um, which mobile giant SoftBank released in 2015 as the world's first personal robot that reads emotions, although it hasn't had a great history since then. Powderdo, this conversation robot designed by Fujisoft to facilitate conversation with elderly users. Um, Lovat or Raboto, this duo of two furry robots and wheels that the company Groovax says are powered by love, as well as by their proprietary emotional robotics technology. Sony's latest Ibo reincarnate, Ibo re released 12 years after discontinuation to great anticipation in 2018, as well as even more evocative robots like Android Canon Minda, Japan's first Android Bodhisattva installed at a popular Zen temple in Kyoto to offer teaching on the Heart Sutra and on which we um, expect to have a publication out um, this year. So just to conclude this section and segue to Hiro, um, all these examples illustrate for us how amusement and fun in robotics design serves as a dominant value that is exercised through feeling, um, through sensing what seems to make a robot alive and which is dependent upon how a robot forms particular relations with humans within recent histories in Japan of other modes of caring for inanimate objects, to allude to, again, um, Fabio's research, um, as well as to ongoing developments in technology and, and AI that we see ongoing today. And to better demonstrate some of these histories of how entertainment is intertwined with care, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Hiro to give us some more historical background on uh, a transition from digital to what we are calling haptic creatures. So with that, I will uh, just hand it over to, to Hiro. Okay, uh, thanks, Don. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, so now I'd like to continue Dan's talk by addressing the recent history of the ways social robots or companion robots have developed not only within the domain of robotics engineering, but also in partnership with an uh, emerging, emerging market of technologically based forms of care, which is closely linked to the amusement industry. Uh, by placing uh, social robots in the context of a social technical lineage of virtual and machinic creatures, uh, most specifically with the rise of virtual and digital pets since the 1990s, I explore how relationships with artificial creatures are uh, shaped through a form of affective modulation and experimentation. And social robotics is a field focused on building agents that can communicate with humans and assist them in their daily lives. Uh, while the idea has been explored in Anglophone literature since the early uh, 2000s, 
The notion of building robots that interact with and support humans has a longer history in Japan. And most characteristic of this history is a concern with designing robots, not only for specific tasks, but more importantly, as socially capable robotic persons that can act as a partner in daily life. as a sense of autonomy and facilitate a mutual uh, recognition and of each other's uh, presence. However, uh, the development of the social and relational capabilities of such robots cannot be viewed merely within the framework of technological accumulation in the scientific fields of robotics and artificial intelligence research. Rather, uh, these capacities have also been shaped by a broader entertainment marketplace in which human emotional needs and desires are tested within technologically mediated feedback loops between producers and consumers through different robotic, robotic platforms. And in this sense, so social robots uh, participate in shaping a lineage of techno intimacy, the intimacy formed between human and technologically constituted entities that has uh, developed out of experiments in entertainment fields, such as video games, such as video games and toys. And within this historical trajectory, social robots in Japan have appeared as platforms that can expand possibilities of intimacy beyond the purpose of pure amusement and create new opportunities for care and comfort. So realizing such opportunities depends on advancements in information and data science and communication technologies Megatronics, robotics, and the field of AI, as well as the fields of post-functionalist post design and sense engineering, or Kansei Kogaku, and cute engineering, uh, which aim to appeal directly to socially uh, conditioned bodily sense senses, or what we call affect. So this trajectory of techno intimacy can be traced to the digital companion. And uh, the next next slide, please. Tamagotchi, uh, released by the entertainment company Bandai. Of course, uh, many of you have may, I may have played with this before. And the first ser series of Tamagotchi launched in 1996, exploding in popularity and creating a social phenomenon. And, and Bandai eventually sold 40 million uh, units worldwide, uh, 20 million in Japan and 20 million outside Japan. This first generation of Tamagotchi was modeled on the idea of raising pets, with Tamagotchi described as an egg-shaped portable get uh, egg-shaped portable pet whose personality and appearance changes depending on how they how the player raises it. So the player feeds, cleans up after, and plays with the character, which appears on the screen of the egg-shaped watch and evokes a sense of uh, biological life. If the player communicates with the virtual head frequently, it will be in a good mood, but if the player forgets to feed or fails to clean up after it, it will be in a bad mood or in the worst, uh, in the worst case, even die. So after a certain amount of time, Tamagotchi will develop into various characters. Uh, each reflecting, reflecting the character and mood fostered by its player or carer. So by modeling the biological rhythms involved in the care of a flesh and blood pets, Tamagotchi incorporated not only cuteness, but also labor, duty, and the responsibility associated, associated with the game setting, bringing a new uh, reality to gameplay. And then in turn, this blurring of the boundary between the virtual space and everyday life allowed gameplay to unfold in the player's lived reality and time. So Tamagotchi's continuous growth and demand for attention and care at all hours of the day, uh, regardless of the player's circumstances, facilitated an effective attunement between player and a virtual creature by dynamically connecting the game's rhythmic algorithm to the player's uh, biorhythms in daily life. So we suggest that this technologically mediated form of effective intimacy 
that Tamagotchi enables between human and digital creatures sets an important precedent in Japan for experimenting with and building subsequent uh, robotic companion species that engender social transformation. And this transformation is marked by a shift from time spent in interpersonal relationships to relationships increasingly, increasingly mediated and occupied by digital technologies and the evocative agents in which they are embedded. And such uh, increased increases in techno intimacies, intimacy serve as the metric for evaluating not only the rapid growth of a mobile uh, computing in Japanese public culture, but also of a transition to forms of care served increasingly by digital technologies and the data infrastructures, such as mobile internet uh, um, providers, Wi-Fi, cable networks, and cloud services that support them. So from, from this perspective, such technologies do not merely address declining forms of human-based intimacy and increasing socioeconomic precarity that characterize post-bubble Japan, but also create opportunities for new forms of intimacy uh, through technological forms of experimentation. And since the spread of Tamagotchi, a variety of virtual pets and mechanical creatures from communication toys for children to expensive social robots introduced to care homes have been sought after as friendly, friendly interactive partners. And while there are, there are a variety of social robots in existence in Japan today with different capacities for connecting emotionally with uh, humans, in this section, I want to trace one development particular to the field of haptic interaction because it illustrates an interface, we think, not only between human and robot, but also between the entertainment and care robot markets. Haptic interaction refers to interactive experiences by which human robot contact points or contact zones are created through external stimuli such as rounded, cute design that invite touching or holding and soft and warm materials that stimulate comfort through touch and cute or kawaii voices that activate the auditory systems. By delivering external stimuli to users through theories of evocative design and experimental techniques to trial and error, producers aim to, uh, producer, producers aim to induce feelings feelings of fun, pleasure, comfort, and even healing or yashi to the people's interaction, interactions with the machine. So to put it um, another way, the efficacy of techno intimacy is cultivated and enhanced, enhanced through experiments with techniques and technologies of effective attunement between people and machines. Okay, so to illustrate this development process, consider one example from the same period as Tamagotchi. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. The video game Sima, the forbidden, uh, forbidden Pets, produced for the Sega Dreamcast in 1999. In this game, the player could not only, could not, could not only talk to the virtual character, but also pick it up to observe it with a virtual hand uh, shown on the screen. Uh, linked to the controller or tap the virtual, ta uh, virtual tank with a finger cursor to call what uh, tickle it. This virtual mechanism for uh, tactile interaction anticipated future possibilities for uh, physical inter interaction with robots equipped with tactile sensors that appeared later. And another example of companion uh, creatures em emerging during this period was uh, Furby. And next, next slide, please. Which hit the market first in the US in 1998 and then in Japan in 1999. And Furby was a talking electronic plush toy in the form of a small, uh, smally furry pet. And Furby's distinctiveness was formed in the combination of tactile and algorithm based development uh, capacities to uh, form relationships with owners. And equipped with tactile sensors on the tongue, 
belly and back and respond back to, uh, to being stroked. Fabi was programmed to grow by being cared for. And when hugged and played with and fed, Fabi grew in four steps and spoke about 800 words, including Fabi language, in, uh, Japanese in the version sold for the Japanese market, and onomatopoeia. In the genealogy of techno intimate, uh, intimate design, the emergence of its multiple modes of communication and interaction made Farby into the first significant mass produced uh, multimodal interface, expanding possibilities for intimate uh, interactions between people and future haptic creatures. And roughly a year after the appearance of Farby, a multimodal companion toys began to come equipped with not only behavioral, but also emotional models. And next slide, please. A Pucci dog-shaped robot but a toy released by Sega Toys in 2000 was equipped with a program called the Heart Circuit, or Kokoro Kaido, in addition to its more uh, conventional sound, light, and tactile sensors. The heart circuit consists of an algorithm that mimics human uh, biorhythms linked to a good mood and bad mood. The frequency of communication by the user, such as hitting the head or talking to the robot, and changes the cycle of the artificial biorhythms, which is reflected in the emotional uh, expressions and uh, actions of Pooch. This algorithmic model integrates integrating human interaction and robot development for, formed its most sophisticated embodiment time in Sony's. Can you still hear me? Okay, okay. We was right. Okay. I think my my earphone just <laughs> lost the battery. So okay, let me go back. Um, Okay, so this algorithmic model integrating human interaction and robot development found its most sophisticated embodiment, embodiment uh, at the time in Sony's pet robot Ivo, re released in 1999. Ivo's uh, degree of technological sophistication and hefty price tag, US about US $2,500, blood the line between toys and robotics ushering in a new period of development that expanded the market for com uh, companion robot pets into broader and older segments of the population. The boom of the commercialization of virtual organisms in the late 1990s uh, thus serves as an important moment that carried over into the la later development of AI-equipped companion robots in Japan. Most importantly, these early experiments in human-robot interaction reveal that what equips these creatures with a sense of uh, vitality is not only the technological system that models the behavior of living things, nor is it merely the philosophical question these agents inspire about the su uh, sufficient ontological conditions for life. Rather, as psychological Sherry Tuckle addresses, it is the value of the interface that makes an agent seem alive and affectionate and capable of diverse and unpredictable social interactions, what Dan described earlier as a semekan. The key component in cultivating a connection between human and robot is thus the affective attunement established within a human-robot relation. Uh, distinction that emerges in Japanese robotics between emotion modeling and haptic interaction is important for understanding how experimentation increasingly uh, drives collaborations between entertainment robotics corporations and robotic researchers, and many of them working to imagine how robots might better care for people in Japanese society. In the 1990s, uh, several researchers were endeavoring to create artificial emotions in robots, such as uh, Sugano Shigeki's Wamueba, uh, What's the Artificial Mind on Emotion Base, and Tosa Naoko's uh, New York Baby. And the goal of these projects was to build a scientifically a, a universal model of emotion, which ironically remained only demonstrable in an experimental environment. On the other hand, the market for virtual creatures for children 
which appeared in succession during the 1990s, served as productive platforms uh, through which to explore the design features and con con conditions that foster opportunities for positive affective attunement. What is most important for our discussion here is that the, impo uh, the importance of care and the sense of touch in the construction of techno intimacy was discovered not in laboratory settings, but in the tinkering process of, of experimentation linked to people's lives navigated and negotiated within uh, capitalist mass markets, and then we imported in, into robotics development. So the 1990s boom in virtual creatures thus uncovered the potential of a market for intimate relationships with virtual and machinic uh, companions and became the driving force behind the blossoming, blossoming of haptic creatures that helped integrate technological development, human robot affect, and the growth of entertainment robotics. Okay, so with this historical context in mind, let's shift our focus to the latest Japanese social robots, especially the ones we call haptic creatures. Okay, uh, next, yeah, next slide. Yeah. First up is a robot called Kubo, a headdress robotic cat-like cushion designed by Yukai Engineering to elicit comfort, uh, comfort through the tail movement. And yeah, I will just uh, let a video clip to do the talking for this robot. So uh, Dan, please uh, uh, go to the next slide and play. Shippo. それは言葉のいらないコミュニケーションツール。空母。空母は尻尾のついたクッション型セラピーロボット。そっと撫でるとふわふわと、たくさん撫でるとブンブンと。そして時々気まぐれに尻尾を振って答えてくれます。それは動物のようにあなたを癒すコミュニケーション。尻尾セラピーで癒しのある毎日が始まります。心を癒す尻尾クッション。空母。and the second example is Panasonic's, uh, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. And the second example is Panasonic's Nikobo, the round and quickly, quickly easy going roommate, uh, Kimamana Dokyoni, <laughs> that's the concept of design. And okay, can you play, uh, Dan, just, can you play? Okay, and I'll keep just talking. And it learns to recognize its owner's face. So Nikobo learns to recognize its owner's face and respond to their voice and touch. And when patted, it will wag its tail uh, like Kubo. It learns to recognize certain words and uh, phrases and will sometimes, re sometimes respond to this and sometimes not. Underscoring the message that Nikobo has feeling and moods of its own. And it, it may sometimes speaks, uh, speak spontaneously. And also Nikobo will sometimes give a sign that it needs a hug. It learns how to interact with its own uh, gradually, uh, yeah, interact with its owner gradually. So then according to its official website, uh, next slide please. Okay. Okay, so according to its official website by Panasonic, the, the concept of a companion that relies on its owner is not new. 25 years ago, the Tamagotchi virtual uh, pet took Japan and then the world, world by storm. It too required nurturing by its owner. Nikobo and other new generation companion devices are logical development of this concept updated with 21st century technology to support 21st century lifestyles. So interestingly enough, the, the techno intimacy that has been developed experimentally since Tamagotchi is consciously and uh, now consciously, consciously reflected in the concept of the, the, this robot here. 
Okay, so to conclude this, uh, my section. Uh, so uh, through these examples, I have aimed to just briefly introduce the concept of haptic creatures in order to draw attention to this process where amusement and care in inter intersects to ground it in a history of collaborations between the entertainment robotics industry and robotics and AI researchers in Japan, and to demonstrate how technological experimentation can build new service in the service industries that drive uh, social, emotional, and interpersonal uh, renewal through affect modulation. While it is too early to say to what extent consumers will continue to seek comfort in haptic creatures and what visions of human robot social sociality will crystallize as a consequence, it is clear uh, that haptic creatures will uh, pay an important role in shaping the future ethics and politics of Japan's machine-inclusive machine machine multi-species society. And the conclusion for the whole uh, talk. So in conclusion, we want to suggest there is a long history and many current examples of a, a mutually constructive relationship between fun, amusement, and entertainment on one hand, and practices of social and interpersonal care on the other. And we think that bringing, bring, um, bring, uh, bringing these histories and examples into discussion of care, uh, care robotics can help us better understand why robots and robotics are so heavily emphasized in the care sector in ways that go beyond discussions of demo demographic, labor, and Japan's aging society. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, so to our audience, please uh, put your questions into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, there already is a raised hand. I just wanted to quickly clarify. Did I read that right? The Nikobo, it farts. That's, that's what, what it said on the slide. Yes, yes, it farts. That's, that's okay, part so that, of yeah, the characters. Yeah, I didn't actually, so that yeah. part of the engagement is precisely that. I, I thought that was quite interesting because it, it sort of brings back um, the question to the, to, to, the, the, to the sort of ontological dimension. I think what really came through in both your talks is that these things are real because they have a body, because they're embodied and they, they can have emotions because the emotion becomes embodied um, in the artifact um, as well. And that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, if you wanted to have something that just whacks its tail or occasionally farts, um, that's, that's, I think is, is quite a different question. Um, okay, we have, we have a one raised uh, hand. Uh, again, please put your questions into the Q and A uh, or into the chat, or please raise your hand. Um, um, we have one question in the Q and A uh, from Kyoko Claire. Uh, I'm just going to read it out. Are there any models that respond to the need of the owner, such as Alexa, which found a wide range of users with its practicality? Uh, all the models shown seem to be rather primitive, only good for children or aging people to me. Okay. I'll... You can, you can yeah, start if you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, this is actually a very important point that um, many, of the, many of the models which are incorporated into the presently available robots are indeed in a quite primitive state. So there is this gap between the fantasy of what robots might be able to deliver in terms of care in Japanese society and what they can actually deliver right now. And roboticists are, are actually quite keenly aware of this gap and often use this gap to their advantage or perhaps because they have to um, in order to continue to, to make their robots evocative. And so this idea of imagination, of sozoryoku, or imaginative power, is actually cited by roboticists as, as an important point, um, important aspect of building robots. So what this means is that it's not just the platforms, it's not just the models which facilitate human-robot intimacy. It's very much the stories and the storytelling that go around them. And that's what you can see in, in the media examples with um, that, that Hiro showed. And, in other presentations, we, we do rely quite heavily on um, 
the media and the commercialization, the delivery, the, the communication and the stories that, that go um, with these robots. And, and many times the robots themselves, because of their limitations, those limitations themselves are turned into something which can elicit care even more. Um, Okada Michio has talked about the concept of, you know, of soft or, or weak robots, robots that elicit um, a kind of sense that they must be taken care of. So that can, that sense of limitation can actually be built into the relationship if you tell the right story. Um, to try to answer your, your question a little bit more directly though, uh, to be fair, are there um, other robots or, or devices that um, I don't cater specifically to, to children or the elderly. I mean, you do have devices like um, Gatebox, um, which created uh, Azuma Hikari, this virtual character, which was um, originally sort of imagined um, for what's called otaku in Japan, sometimes um, imperfectly translated as, as nerds or technophiles. Um, so this was a, a character very much um, in the form of an animated ishojo or cute young girl. Um, you can interact with um, this character directly through this sort of virtual platform that um, sat on your desk. You can text message this character. Um, and that sets you have a, you have a much more multimodal model uh, of emotion that's based on on text and, and sentiment analysis. Um, so there's, there are other, there are other robots, there are other platforms and there's not, I think what's important about this is that there's not one single entertainment robot market or amusement robot market in Japan. There's different niches, um, catering to different, um, people, but at the same time, these engineers and producers never know exactly how or to whom the robots are going to be popular. And that's why there's always this aspect of experimentation within the market of, um, companion robot building and emotion uh, motion model building. Yeah, well, let me just add uh, Dan's comments. Uh, I think he pretty much covered what I wanted to say, but just add something uh, what Dan uh, said to uh, from a different angle that, uh, well, in reality, uh, people easily actually get bored. Many people actually get bored with robots. And for instance, in the case of, especially like, you know, in the case of like Tamagotchi and for example, like Bandai misjudged the timing of the end of the boom and they made a actually huge loss. But however, like for the case of the, you know, the toys like that, you know, in the case of Tamagotchi, they, there have been three new versions of Tamagotchi since then. And as for robots equipped with the latest uh, AI technology, there is a like built-in uh, feedback loop system, system in which the user's actions are ultimately reflected to in the robot's behavior. And that's, this is the way by which the robots, are, uh, I mean, corporations and uh, the companies try to develop their robots. So in this sense, going back to our talk, in this sense, the market for robotics and robotic, to robotic toy becomes a uh, so the testing ground, I think it's it a growing testing ground for the development of techno, uh, techno intimacy, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, if I just can quickly follow up on that, because I think that, I mean, it's a really interesting question, uh, the, the role of imagination, but also because both of the robots, the last ones that we saw, Kubo and uh, Nikobo, they were both um, sort of um, described as uh, robots that create healing, Yashi. And I, I thought there was something really interesting in the simplicity of it. It's precisely, you don't want to come home, have a long day of work and deal with a very complex machine. Uh, many things could go wrong, you know, but you want to have something very simple. Um, and that reminded me of Denis Vidal's point that, you know, actually what you have is, 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 is a case of sub-anthropomorphism. The machine doesn't have to be very human-like or look very human or present this kind of interface in order for it to make sense as a companion, right? It can be something very simple, a cushion that whacks its tail that reacts to your presence in a way. Uh, and it, it's healing precisely because you don't have to think of it as, you know, some kind of artificial intelligence kind of thing. Mm. Just, just, just a comment. So we have, we have uh, uh, two more hands up. Uh, can I ask Mohamed uh, Ajnabi to um, 
speak. Sorry, I, I, I just, um, yes. Yeah. Hello? Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Very insightful. Uh, my, my, my basic question is, um, is you know, as a, I was a regular visitor to Japan and I'm very much intrigued with, you know, the constructs of animism in the general culture. And I was wondering how, if at all, you know, the philosophy of animism is actually uh, trickling itself towards, and this might be a, you know, a question to, um, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, Katsuno-san uh, or whoever in the team might be able to answer, how much of that animism you might feel is actually trickling into these newer models of, of, of robot uh, or tech intimacy uh, platforms that are now actually being availed to the public? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the question. And I know that maybe Fabio wants to say something a lot about this uh, question, but yeah, let me just try to answer as much as possible. And, and I understand that uh, people try to associate the Japanese like traditional, like especially like Shinto animism to the contemporary uh, like a relationship of, I mean, human robot relationship in Japan and try to explain the kind of a, kind of a particular Japanese relationship with robot through the, uh, by applying the, you know, traditional Shinto animism. But I don't have to fully agree with, you know, the way in which, as I said, like a traditional Shinto animism is applied to think about the relationship between human robots today. And we, in our presentation, uh, we focused on the notion of a sense of life, uh, which is clearly a phenomenon created by a complex, a complex interplay between technological affordances and human imagination and the context of the situation in which and the actual interaction plays. And uh, in addition to this, I would like to emphasize the relationship between, uh, especially in the case of the uh, haptic creatures, relationship between the touch and affect and emotion. And I think that tactile, tactile interaction has not been really taken into account in the traditional discussion of, of animism. But however, I, as I talked today, uh, robot designers are now today actively uh, targeting the human sense of touch in order to create a sense of life in robots. And that's, I think we really have to focus on when talking about the kind of anim the shaping of anim animistic in, um, uh, imagination in people's uh, relationship robots. So then in this sense, um, I think it is not the traditional model of animism that is important when thinking about the robot uh, robotic animism or well, animism surrounding robots, but rather maybe one way, one possible uh, thinking is maybe like capitalist animism. And the capitalist animism is a, is a concept um, advocated by uh, Stephen Shavairo, philosopher Stephen Shavairo and anthropologist Michael Tausig, and even uh, culture critic uh, back in 1940s, uh, Taihei Mamura, in his analysis, he analyzed uh, Disney's the cartoons. And what they basically say is uh, that by, you know, the giving life to, you know, the cartoon characters and robots, humans are basically using them as new labor force. So I think, so in this sense, this concept is important in that it reconnects the robot in Japan with original meaning of the robot, the labor force, in, in Japanese, you know, because in Japanese discourse, as I think lots of people, you know, uh, imagine that they try to uh, say that, you know, the robots appear as a friend, but uh, by applying the capital, capitalist animism, we can see that, you know, kind of an implicit uh, relationship with robots in Japan, especially as a mode of production of popular culture in Japan. So robots and characters are used as a kind of tool for, uh, capital accumulation. So, so yeah. So, so, so what I want to say is, so it's it's a it's, you know I don't intend to, but I don't intend to reduce the relationship between human robots 
you know, completely to this Marxist interpretation. But my view is that there are multiple animism-like developments uh, intertwined, intertwining each other. Does this uh, make sense? So yeah, it's, it's actually, yeah. No, no, talk. very, very, very insightful. Well, Thank you. <laughs> okay. Really appreciate it. And I, I, I think there's a lot of interplay that's actually happening. But, you know, again, it's like you said, there is a, a more, a, a different, a more, maybe more modernized view, capitalist view of, of how that works, which is, uh, you know, equally insightful and interesting. So thank you for answering that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So there's a, there's another question um, in the uh, Q&A. Um, let's start with the top one. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee asked, uh, does that mean that they can use this history and knowledge or that this history and knowledge could also be used to create androids with very similar human characteristics to create human companions for those who see company in a more human way? You do it by taking your silence as an inv invitation. <laughs> can you can you cover that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can start. Um, so I think what we find, which is very interesting in the move um, from SoftBank's Pepper to a robot like um, Lovat by GrooveX, is actually a move away from this idea of providing a kind of comfort or a kind of companion, which is based off human to human relationships. Um, you know, so Masayoshi, when when SoftBank first came out with this idea of you know the first world's first emotion emotional robot or the first robot that can read human emotions, it was kind of presented as the dream of Masayoshi Son as this idea of. of bringing a humanoid robot into society and having specifically human robot relations. Um, and in that sense, you can see in the fact that Pepper is itself quite a humanoid robot. Um, and it can read human emotions and Pepper itself, even though it was not implemented very well, it did have, again, Paul Ekman's model of facial expression recognition um, built into it and had that capacity that was usable in some applications. Um, so here we have a very human model of emotion built into a humanoid robot working off a model that robots in order to provide care for humans should be based off a kind of human emotion or human emotion theory. Hayashi Kaname, who is in charge, the CEO of GrooveX and came up with Love, I think, conjunction with others, actually worked on the design team um, to some extent in SoftBank to help develop Pepper in a limited capacity. Um, and he's been quoted as, as saying in some articles that he was quite disappointed with um, how the direction of Pepper went. As a consequence, and you can see this quite clearly, what he developed and what is actually, I think, is fair to say, gotten um, well, this has gotten substantial attention um, that Love It Robot is not based on a human model of emotion. Of course it does, again, like many of these robots have the capacity to read human facial expressions, but it purposefully is designed to not respond in a human way. For example, if you touch Lovat's nose, in Lovat's nose is a sensor, and then that nose will buzz when you press it. And then Lovat's eyes will go like a kind of a little cross-eyed, it gives a response which is not human, really. It's not, and it's not, you know, cat-like, it's not dog-like, it's something else. It's something fictional and fantasy-like. It's something that you would imagine coming more from a sort of manga or anime, animation, rather than from a real life experience. And here we can see quite clearly how kind of ideas of, of amusement um, and entertainment coming from anime and manga are built into robots in a way that don't reference human psychology and emotion like previous robots did. Um, so I think here we, we see again this experimentation with what care means in the context of the entertainment robot market where it's not necessarily going to be based on what we think or what psychologists suggest humans quote unquote need in terms of human care, the sort of sufficient conditions and Malinowski's um, hierarchy of needs for example. Rather, um, designers are, are operating in this quite creative and experimental way 
to see if we can sort of push human robot um, intimacy and pleasure and amusement into new and unexplored territory. Would you add anything to that, Hiro? Yeah, maybe, okay. Maybe one point that I could add is uh, maybe uh, in relation to the concept of uh, techno intimacy. So shaped between robots and uh, humans. And so, yeah, so maybe we should ask, uh, so what what kind of, you know, intimacy is? Is it a kind of a largely a lost intimacy between humans, kind of a nostalgic intimacy, or is it a new form of intimacy? And I would say that this is a, you know, uh, it's a kind of a new intimacy uh, or a new relationship supported by new imaginaries and emotions in, in accordance with affects you know, never experienced before, felt in interaction with a new technological agents. And I think that's, uh, yeah, I think another important point maybe we should explore more. Thank you. So, I think that yeah, last so, point is really It's a, not just a substitute of something, but it's a kind of new companion species. And I think that also it relates to the earlier point that you made that, you know, if you take sort of a very Marxist framework and you say, what kind of labor is being replaced? When you say these the robots actually do effective labor, then they sort mm -hmm. of replace uh, other humans that would do it otherwise. But I think that's, uh, I can't imagine at this point anybody having the expectation that, you know, it could, that the, the machine or the or, or, or the cushion or whatever it is can really provide that kind of uh, uh, that kind of effective labor but it, there is something else going on and something that is playful I think that's really important and there's a, there's another uh, brilliant question in the q a that refers to that a little bit and it's going to read it out um, from Yuko Tamaki Wellplay um, hello, it was a very rich and interesting presentation, maybe replied in part to my question referring to animism, but I still have two questions. One, do you think that there is any relationship between fun and therapy? If yes, do you think how they are interrelated? Is being fun one important element of therapy? So that's one question. And the second is, do you think that amusement as therapy is Japanese specific or Asian specific? because of the different relationships of human and object between Occidental and non-Occidental society. I hope I make myself clear. Thank you in advance for your reply. That's an excellent question. Whenever the word Asian is, is referenced, I, I tend to leave <laughs> that to Hito <laughs> to answer this. Hito, did you want to start? With that first, uh, or do you want me to well, delay a few minutes? Yeah, well, I want to say something about, well, going back to my, you know, my part of the talk, the the sense of touch. And I don't know, I can't really, well, kind of try to think how, you know, the tactile interaction, the kind of cultural differences, you know, the different meanings the tactile interaction actually gives to uh, people. Uh, in different cultural settings, and let me let me just keep thinking. And maybe if you want, can go first. Then then. Okay, okay. I'll try. Um, so I'll say something very very briefly about the second question. Um, of course, as as anthropologists these days, when we're asked a question about you know, is something culturally specific? Is it is it Asian specific? Specific to Occidental non Occidental? Of course, our little kind of antennas go up, and we're we're trained to to reply to that, that it's more complicated. Um, of course, that's, that's often sort of a way anthropologists uh, get out of answering these questions, which a lot of people <laughs> have. And in many ways, they're, they're quite fair questions because the way we are trained in, in media and popular culture to see cultural differences. Um, but in reference to that, I would say that, um, you know, in one sense, this, this question is actually quite poignant because I think it is fair to say that um, in many segments of Japanese society, I'm not saying in Japan as a whole that Japan is like this, but I'm saying in many different and variegated ways in Japanese society, people practice play in different ways than they do elsewhere. Um, that people, um, 
bring play also into different aspects of life. So, I mean, if you just turn on, you know, the TV in the evening in, in Japan, you'll see what's called variety, bangumi TV shows, um, variety shows, and, and you'll see adults doing all sorts of, of playful things, right? Um, and if there's a, a very serious issue to be um, determined, sometimes even in like, I mean, even I've been in, in certain faculty meetings when I worked in Japan where a decision came to who, who was going to take responsibility for what came down to rock, scissors, paper to determine who's going to, to do what. So play is practiced in a lot of different places in Japan. Um, what that says about therapy, I think, is a slightly different question. And it, to be honest, is not one I could speak to because the therapy question is a question formulated within a long history of psychology, which has you know, it has its genealogies in, in the West, which was incorporated into Japan and that it was altered and changed with prominent um, Japan psychologists in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so therapy is, is a very psychological thing. And the people, the, res, the robotics, roboticists and the robot fans that we often talk to, we're not thinking in these terms, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Oisan certainly was not thinking about um, Aibo as, as a therapeutic device. At the same time, um, you know, his, his partner, uh, Norimatsu-san, um, absolutely thought that um, amusement, fun, a sense of lightheartedness and care, I'm sorry, uh, the sense of amusement and fun was central to care, was a way to care for people. So in that sense, that's sort of, I don't see that as necessarily a reference to a kind of um, amusement and play as a tool for therapy. I see that more as how I sort of tried to answer your second question, in that there are lots of places, again, different places in Japanese society where play is used for something specific, used as a practice for, uh, for something, for whether it's communication, for solving problems, um, for entertainment, or or whatever it may be. And robots are an extension of this. And thus, back to our original, and again, somewhat vulgar argument, this is why I think it's important to look at the entertainment robotics industry in reference to the care robot um, industry and see that what's going on in the care market is not just officials um, and um, politicians and bureaucrats saying, okay, let's solve the care problem through robots, not at all. It's that um, robotics is part of a history of fun and amusement and relationality and relation building between humans and between characters and between objects that gets built into and then encourages what's going on in the care sector. Does that help, Hiro? Yeah, well, I think you, Sorry, I, I, I still need time. So maybe if I, yeah, something came up in my mind, I can probably come back. Yes, and sounds good. Combine with, yeah, com combine with some, yeah, some other answers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there will be, there's another question. Are we going to get the recording of this, this event? Yes, there will be a recording that you can find on the JSC homepage. It usually takes a few days to upload. So check um, back. Uh, frequently. Um, and we have another hand up um, in uh, over here, Lyman Gamberton. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for a, uh, a suitably entertaining and very, very interesting talk. Um, I was particularly struck by the Aibo Kuyo uh, and thinking about funerals held for non-human companions in Japan, uh, like ningyo kuyo, doll funerals. And ningyo kuyo, uh, funerals for, for dolls and for soft toys, end the same way that human funerals do with cremation, usually open air burning. Um, but of course, you're talking about the Aibo being recycled and sort of uh, harvested for spare parts, basically, which of course made me think about um, Margaret Locke's work on human organ don donation in Japan. And so I'm very interested in the sort of what happens after the end of the funeral in terms of corporeality and materiality of these objects, a human 
a doll, a soft toy can be burned, the Ibo cannot. So I'm wondering, did any of your respondents expand further on sort of the recycling aspect or the, the ongoing existence of parts of these Ibo after they were, um, after they were, they, they reached the end of their, um, you know, what we might call their natural lifespan. Thank you again for such an interesting evening. Yeah, thank you very much for that for that question. Um, I, I can start again with this. This is a, definitely a question I, I, I think we would do well to leave time for Fabio to say something on as well because he does have a lot of experience in this topic. Um, and uh, we would definitely value hearing his opinion on this as well. I'm um, just very briefly though on um, what happens corporally, corporality in terms of the, the IBO robot. So what's quite interesting for us is that um, there, may, there may be a temptation, especially when you're doing a history of sort of funerary services or kuyo services for artificial objects to look at them as the same thing, as that this is a Japanese sort of ritual um, that takes the same form, but just with different objects. And I think what we see here is that that's not necessarily the case, that um, a seemingly similar ritual can be used to address very different things, can be used um, to solve a different problem um, and then can have different effects. So you're absolutely right. And this is a, a wonderful observation that uh, the IBO are not burned obviously, um, but they're broken down into spare parts. And this is where Norimatsu-san actually saw some a bit of an, an economic um, incentive here to create a company that could use those broken down IBO parts, um, respect them through a ceremony, but actually use those robot parts to build, um, sorry, to, to um, essentially care for or repair other broken down IBO. So literally what happens when um, the ceremony is over is that um, employees from uh, Norimasu-san's company pack up all the eyeballs into boxes and send them to his warehouse. And then he essentially has these robot parts and they're seen as robot parts now. And because through the process of the ceremony, at least officially, the, the souls of the robots have been sent to the, the Western Pure Land essentially. So all we have left are um, mechanical parts that can be safely reincorporated into other IBO. Um, bodies. Now, I think what's what's also interesting to say about that, um, and that again illustrates how these rituals are always changing and being reinterpreted and, and used to solve different problems, is that with the new IBO, um, you have more sophisticated um, software technologies and cloud capacities, so that if an IBO, the new IBO, was mechanically malfunctioning, because its quote unquote soul is stored online on Sony central server, um, or what they call the home zone, um, then that essence, the soul, the tamashi of the robot could potentially be downloaded into a new robot body. And you would either have a new, essentially the same robot soul in a different robot body, or you would leave it up to the customer to work out philosophically and ontologically what's going on here. Um, so with that, I definitely invite both Hito and Fabio to say something about this as well. Um, not much, but I just wanted to add that actually uh, back in, I think, early 2000s, there was a Tamagotchi Kuyo, and quite similar, uh, like, uh, you know, like in the Kuma, I mean, similar context as Aibo Kuyo. So I think it's really interesting how, you know, digital, uh, you know, the inanimate stuff becomes like, get, you know, kind of a, get a life through these kind of rituals and all like going and going again and again. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can add to, add to this is that actually it's only a very small number um, of, of dolls that get burned in the end. Most end up in landfill precisely because the materials that they're made of are no longer really burnable. Um, and so it, it's quite rare to have a, a burning and you can immediately smell the difference um, when, you know, plastic um, is burned. But the, the, the thought behind it um, is, I mean, it's, it's fairly similar and there are actually rare cases when some kind of material appropriation um, happens um, after the ceremony, uh, after the kuyo has been performed. And so some, sometimes uh, these uh, sort of, especially 
the brocade, uh, if it is antique, can be actually reused uh, to create new dolls. Uh, but they're usually not the traditional sort of, um, you know, slightly stiff, upright uh, Hina dolls, but uh, they're more playful, uh, often taking the sort of uh, shapes of uh, other Engi mono, like cats. Um, so there's an interesting, there's sort of an afterlife uh, to that material, which you could also see in the Ibo case, which I thought was really um, interesting. Okay, so we've come to the end um, of our time. Thank you very much to our presenters for a really interesting and thought-provoking um, presentation. There will be a recording uploaded on the website. Um, so please check back and please tell your friends who may not have been able um, to join us uh, today. And I just wanted to draw your attention to the next event, which will happen on the 23rd of February. And we are hoping that that will be um, in-house. So back in the lecture theater, uh, we will host a panel discussion with Dr. Rosino Buckland from the British Museum. Uh, she is the new curator of the Japanese collections. And we will talk about activating collections and interrogating provenance. So, all it remains for me to say is thank you very much to Hiro and Ben. Thanks for a fascinating um, evening. And uh, I hope you all have a good rest of the night. <laughs>